When Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she bore unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land, and when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul cleaved unto Dina, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spoke kindly unto her. And Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me the damsel for a wife. What is the nature of defilement? What is the nature of obsession? What is love that persists in the face of degradation? Is there redemption in stories of the most dangerous type of willful blindness and idolatry? Can violation be forgiven? Can rapture come from ravishment? Can honor be upheld when sacredness is stolen? Can the downtrodden and outnumbered be victorious, scorned by enemies? The story of Dina in the Bible may at first seem like a triggering, sensitive topic, a subject of outrage even. However, upon closer examination, we can see a great love story within this often misinterpreted tale. It is not a Romeo and Juliet story per se, not a story of youthful and reckless star-crossed lovers exactly. However, this story is a story of covenant, soul ties, family honor, filial piety, and propriety. Ultimately, it is a story of salvation and restoration, justice and recompense that manifests in strange and seemingly sordid ways. I personally relate to the story of Dina in very specific ways, and the rich layers of meaning resonate with me deeply. Like many women, I have been violated and survived defilement and assault which started with grooming from predators as a child. The planted seeds of perversion birthing soul ties and erecting demonic altars within my spirit from a young age from which I had to be delivered by God's grace. Perversion projected upon me by adults from a young age was a deliberate theft of my innocence. That can plainly be seen. However, from these seeds of perversion grew the fruits of idolatry as I transitioned into a confused and embittered teenager, wounded by abandonment trauma as the adopted child who never knew her father, nor had brothers or kinsmen to protect or redeem me. Feeling betrayed by the father that never showed up in my life and mishandled and misguided into perversion at the age of 13 by an English teacher, a man of authority in the community we as children are told to trust. I rejected masculinity and a masculine God. My vision of masculinity warped, which propelled me further into witchcraft and the occult, goddess worship and self-idolatry out of a wounded insecurity, a need for approval and validation that transformed into a need to be worshiped as I navigated my objectified and exploited femininity. Because I didn't have the love and protection, support, and affirmation from a father, as a young adult, I sought out esoteric spiritual paths that deluded me to feel empowered by showing me faces of goddesses that were fearsome and seductive, destructive and controlling, alluring and magical. Seeking the family I'd always felt estranged from as an orphan child, I felt I found solace in sister circles and priesthood communities, worshiping goddesses from Celtic and Norse pantheons, Egyptian and Greek mythology, and invoking feminine entities from Hinduism, Candomblé, Kimbanda, and the Orisha of Lukumi and Ifa. The women who influenced me were endearingly complex, witches and seductresses, sex workers and priestesses, birth workers and abortionists. And they seemed so lively, passionate, colorful, full of glittering rage and gleeful shamelessness, which at the time inspired and fascinated me. Like Dina in the Bible, whose scripture says, went out to see the daughters of the land, the women of the city. I too was delighted by the false power I thought I perceived in these strange women and their goddesses. 
their dances naked under full moons, their hands painted with henna and their faces painted with blood, their voices strong with love spells and songs, their lips full of smoke and wine, and their eyes full of the glitter of Datura, Brugmansia, and Ayahuasca. I thought they were wise women. I glorified the whoredoms they arrogantly bragged about, thinking they were glamorized courtesans. I even saw the abortions many of them romanticized as acts of mercy. These strange women who laughed loud and flung their hair, arms adorned with musical bangles, twerking with waists, tinkling with beads. I, like Dina, went out to see them, eyes wide in naivety, seeking sisterhood and even seeking to reconcile my mother wounds from the rejection of my birth mother. Dina, the daughter of Leia, went out with boldness. She did not stay behind in her tent, and hearing the celebration of the women of the city dancing and reveling, went to study their ways. Little did she know, in God's mysterious ways of redemption, she would unwittingly introduce them to a God of righteousness in a covenant of blood. The scripture and history say that when Dina came with her mother to see the daughters of the Canaanites, the prince of the land named Shechem, the son of Hamor, saw her, and his soul longed for her. Immediately he was captured and enraptured, and sought in turn to capture her. Obsessed at first sight, seeing the purity of this young woman set apart from the women of his people, he claimed her and seduced her. Here is where the controversy begins. A case of semantics. It is important then to begin now to dive into the linguistic, cultural, and historical context with which to root the proper understanding of this hotly debated story. And thus we shall begin. Thank you.